Okay. We'll come to order. Today is the Wednesday, January 21st, regular meeting of the Glendale Planning Commission. Could we have a roll, please? Commissioner Sheets. Aye. Commissioner Thorgerson. Here. Commissioner Lee. Here. Commissioner Berman. Here. And Here. Chair King. Here. Uh, report regarding posting of agenda, please. The agenda for this meeting was posted on Wednesday, December 10th, 2008, on the bulletin board outside City Hall. All right. Would everyone please join me, stand, and recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Um, next order of business is uh, election of chairperson for the coming year. Do we have any nominations? Mr. Chair, I would like to uh, put into nomination the current chairman of the Planning Commission, Bill Kane. All right. Do we have any other nominations or a second of the nomination? I second. All right. Any other nominations? We don't want the job. <laughs> um, all right. Seeing no other nominations, and by the way, I'd be happy to serve again. Thank you very much. Um, could we have roll call, please? Commissioner Sheets? Aye. Commissioner Thorderson? Aye. Commissioner Lee? Aye. Commissioner Berman? Aye. And Chair Kane? Abstain. On a vote of 4 to 0 with an abstention, I'll be chairperson again for the coming year. All right. Approval of minutes for December 17th, 2008. Any comments or corrections? I have one. Uh, it is on page four, at the bottom of the page, discussion by commissioners. Um, we were talking about a garage and we were talking about the location of a door and what that meant in terms of the height of the door. And it, the quote was, uh, uh, if the door was on the east side, it becomes a supporting element and a laminated beam or steel support would be great. I basically actually wanted to say it would be required and uh, it was all a function, again, of if you have to put in a beam, it can affect what the overall height of the garage was. So rather than say would be great, just say would be required. That's I, it. I have right. one comment. I think the date needs to be corrected on the uh, number four motion. It says December 17th. I think it needs to refer to the, uh, the previous one. Um, yes, you're right. That should be for the minutes of the third. That's correct. Catch. Impressive. All right. Any I'm other comments, corrections, or can we have a motion to uh, accept as uh, as noted? I move the minutes. Mm. I'll second them. Motion support. Roll call, please. Commissioner Schitz. Aye. Commissioner Thorgerson. Aye. Commissioner Lee. Aye. Commissioner Berman. Aye. And Chair Kane. Aye. In a vote of five to zero, the minutes of December 3rd were approved. And we'll move on. Oral communications, I have no cards. Um, we're going to go slightly out of order on the agenda and go with agenda item 9, which is new business. It's tender of track number 66514. Uh, Vilia, would you like to go through the rest of it? Yes, thank you, uh, Chairperson Kane, Commissioners. The case before you is a tender of track map. This would be a request to subdivide and develop a 47-unit multifamily residential condominium project on a lot that is approximately 23,000 square feet. The project site is located in the SFMU, which is the commercial residential mixed-use zone in the San Fernando Road corridor. The property owner is Mr. and Mrs. Gavorkian and a and Investment Company. The, the owners are being represented by Hark Martirosian this evening. The existing zoning, as I just mentioned, is commercial, residential, mixed-use zoning. The general plan designation is also mixed-use. The project itself was approved by the Design Review Board back in March 2006, and then it w actually went to the Glendale Redevelopment Agency because it is in the San Fernando Road redevelopment area for ultimate approval on June 30th, I'm sorry, July 11th, 2006. The project is currently in plan check, and it has not yet received its permit as to date, but it is in the process of obtaining its permits. The project site, again, as I mentioned, is approximately 23,000 square feet. 
It has frontages on three sides. To the west is Brand Boulevard, to the north is Topak, and to the west is Vassar Avenue. Um, as you'll notice right behind you, actually behind uh, Commissioner Lee, there is an aerial photograph showing the rectangular lot. The project complies with all of the zoning standards for the SFMU zone regarding minimum lot size, um, height, density. In this case, it is a four-story mixed-use development with two levels of subterranean parking. The, it actually has approximately, well, it has 87 units per acre when 100 units per acre are permitted on this particular site. Complies with the required parking, residential open space, and landscaping, as well as all of the various elements of the general plan. Staff recommendation is to approve the tentative track map, case number 66514, with 37 conditions, as stated in your staff report. We also included along in your staff report the mitigated negative declaration that was ultimately approved by the Glendale Redevelopment Agency. And so that was included for your review, which if you don't mind, as part of your motion, recognizing the approval of the mitigated negative declaration. So that concludes staff's brief presentation. I'm available to answer any questions you may have. Questions for staff? I have one. So the motion that has been prepared for us does not already, by reference, acknowledge the negative deck. You want a mitigated negative declaration. For you some want reason, to, I thought that yeah. there was a condition, but yes, we would, we would acknowledge that, please. Right. And we can include that in an amended motion. Okay. I just uh, have one question. Please. I didn't see an architect's name. Was there an architect on that project? Um, there, the plans were actually submitted by... The, it was submitted by J.H. and Associates, architects and planners, and they're located here locally in Glendale. Okay. And that would be represented by Mr. John, Har John Harapetian. Oh, there you go. The logo on the elevations. All right. Any other questions for staff at this moment? Seeing none, I have one speaker card. Back Martirosian. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and uh, Planning Commissioners. My name is Haik Mordirosian. My address is 1545 North Verdugo Road, Glendale. I'm tract engineer. Um, I have reviewed the conditions. Uh, uh, we are uh, uh, fully, uh, uh, will comply fully with these conditions. I have only one uh, condition that I, I like to have uh, uh, clarification from staff. That's regarding condition number 23, regarding impact fees. And uh, I would like to know if this impact fee is uh, different than in lieu fees. And then if it is, then we need more uh, uh, language uh, to put in there because the property owner has already made an agreement with the city regarding uh, in lieu fees, and there are time limits that they have to uh, comply with this condition. So I want to have that condition somehow reflected on this uh, number 23 or 26 so it will be more clear to uh, uh, us and county people when, then, uh, when they are uh, plan checking this. And other than that, uh, uh, as I said, we, are, uh, uh, we will comply with all the conditions. Okay, before we direct that to staff, any questions from the board for the applicant? See now at this second. Let's take that one at a time. Number 24, the appropriate impact fees. And that, w that was discussed um, by the property owners and the city council, and whatever was agreed upon by the city council, those would be the appropriate impact fees. So, so maybe what we should do, appropriate impact fees as determined by city council? That would be fine. <coughs> if I may, Mr. And Chair. And I believe... Mr. Garcia. Yes. Uh, um, the... I believe the, council, the language that the council approved was uh, approving a conditional waiver, so they should pay all appropriate uh, impact fees in accordance with the conditional waiver grant, uh, granted by the city council. So that way, if the, if the conditions are met, then it's granted. If not, then it won't be. That way, it's, it sort of ties in that, that approval already given. So it's determined by the conditional waiver granted by council. That's correct. Okay. And now moving down to 26, it talks about both an 
updated inclusionary plan and then the in lieu fee. And it also talks to the satisfaction of Director of Administrative Services. And what was it you wanted to clarify on that one? Uh, I wasn't sure that this is separate than that impact fee. If it is, then uh, uh, there is some language that they work with the city council that we want to have that included in this language. Mr. Garcia, any oh. suggestions? Sure. Uh, I think that the inclusionary housing plan is still required, but the, the, again, the payment of the in lieu fee should be consistent with the, the conditional waiver that was granted by the council. Um, so uh, maybe the, the 26 should be revised to, to include the inclusionary housing plan and that the fee shall be paid in accordance with the conditional waiver. Thank you. Does that seem appropriate to you, sir? Yes, yes sir. Right. Do we have any other comments from either you or from commission toward you? Uh, I just have, uh, I'd like to just, you know, for the record, uh, we're missing number six. Uh, uh, and then also uh, on page five of seven, you know, we have number 10 and 11 repeated, but I think it should be 13 and 14. Item number 13, 14, and then number, number six, six is missing. So, um, two twelve, number six. Yeah, so I think you need to make that correction. Okay, so that would Let's see be. if the motion fixed it. No, Did the motion correct that, Board Member King? We're finding out. No. Okay, so there was an error with the omission of. Um, it was not an omission. It actually, it was just you know, num the here, numbering. Here, well, here's the way I think it should be. On the motion, page four. Okay. You want to go back where it is, top off? Uh -huh. I believe that's where six should insert. Well, I, Based I, on the fact that H ended and then it starts no, I think AD. it talks about Brand Boulevard. That's oh, what I you. All right. Yeah, so it's part of five. So top park is part of five. Yep, you're right. Yeah. I stand corrected. It's so that thing, the seven should be, and then everything just needs to be Correct. Recorded. So it would just be amending, amending the numbers in terms of the actual. Right. Correcting the count. But the, the numbers number. on the motion are incorrect? The numbers on the motion, it appears that were, those were copies straight right. from the report, so correct. I'm just, but they're so different. Unless I'm reading, they got 9, 10, 11, 12, 10, 11. Right, yeah, so that's, then what, then so that's what you're correct. Right. 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 We will make sure that the, yeah. the motion Same accurately reflects the, the right. correct numbers. I'm okay. <laughs> I'm just wondering if maybe we could figure out what that correct number is so we can note the number that are, we're actually voting on. So I think we have total number uh, 36 items. It would be 36, correct. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're all counting. <laughs> all right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I don't see any other questions for you at this time. Closing comments from staff? None. All right. Uh, any comments from commissioners, or may I call the question, please, and call for a motion? No question. I'm sorry? No question. No question. No question. I think it's a good project. Would you like to make a motion? Okay. I've got the one that corrected. One. It's, it's not corrected. Okay. It's All right. complicated. All right. So um, yeah, I move uh, that upon consideration of alternative track number 66514. And after reviewing the records, files, reports, and all documentary evidence submitted with regard to said tentative track, the tentative track number 66514 is hereby approved subject to compliance with the State Subdivision Map, Map Act, Chapter 16.16 and 16.28 of Title 16 of the Glendale Municipal Code, Title 30 of the Glendale Municipal Code, and the third, 37 addition, or 36 additional conditions listed below. And the Planning Commission hereby makes each and all of the following findings of fact, A through J, and 30, 36 conditions. Plus right. the approved neg um, Plus we acknowledge final mitigated negative deck. Okay, and then, and the, yeah, the uh, acknowledge the final mitigated negative declaration number 2005-50. And we wanted to modify number 24, uh, currently numbered 24 and 26, and to recognize the city council's uh, conditional waiver. Right. And item number 23, I guess, here be, and then 25, mm -hmm. uh, to recognize city council's comments. Great. I have a motion support, please. Second. Motion support. Call roll. 
Commissioner Schiff. Aye. Commissioner Torgerson. Aye. Commissioner Lee. Aye. Commissioner Berman. Aye. Chair Kane. Aye. On a vote of 5 to 0, the tender of track 66514 has been approved. We'll move on to uh, agenda item 7A. This is an appeal. It's PPR 2008-006. It's 1833 Kirkby Road. It's an appeal of the zoning administrator's approval of a parking reduction permit to allow an addition to an existing single-family residence on a property located in the R1R restricted residential zone without providing the required minimum two enclosed parking spaces, parentheses 20 feet interior, two-car garage. Staff's rec um, represented by Bradley Collin, and the recommendation is to uh, have a motion to recommend that the decision of the zoning administrator denying the exception be sustained and the appeal be denied. Staff overview. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. As mentioned, the subject project is a request for a parking reduction permit which is triggered by the existing garage not being considered a two-car garage. And the reason the garage is required to be upgraded is there's applicant is proposing an addition to the house, which triggers the garage to be upgraded to meet current code. This cannot be done due to the shape of the lot and the topography of the lot, thus the reason for the parking reduction permit to request that the existing garage be allowed to be kept as is. Um, basically uh, an overview of the projects. I can give you more detail if you would like. Let me back up for a moment. I apologize, Mr. Collin. There's, there's two things I need to do in terms of bookkeeping. One is I just want to make the announcement concerning appeals and that this is an appeal from the zoning administrator or the zoning hearing officer and the matters heard is a de novo hearing. Testimony given at the zoning administrator's hearing should be repeated because the commission does not review the tapes of those meetings. Decisions rendered today will be based on the evidence presented at this hearing and the evidence in the file including appeal documents, staff reports and letters received. Individuals speaking today should therefore present all the evidence which they may wish this commission to consider. A handout describing the appeals process is available at the front counter. And uh, appeal items are considered as public hearings. The commission will consider testimony from the appellant, applicant, staff, and any member of the public wishing to speak. If you wish to speak, as we've noted previously, please fill out one of the cards and present it to the recording secretary. Sorry, I needed to back up on that. Uh, and the second part of that, Mr. Collin, it, the way the agenda was was read and the way I read it, it said that the Zoning administrator, zoning administrator denied the administrative exception. Didn't, wasn't it actually approved? And this is an appeal of the approval? That's correct. That's correct. Okay. So that was just stated wrong. So we've cleared both of those things up. In the agenda. I, from the agenda. Right. Kim Poison on the agenda yesterday. Yeah, I didn't catch it. All right. So I'm sorry, Mr. Collin. Please continue with your <coughs> overview and so on. That basically that concludes That it completed it? Okay. Any questions for staff initially? Um, excuse me, Chairman um, Kane. We corrected the uh, agenda, and Mr. Foy, I guess, emailed you the corrected right. copy. That had been shared with me. I had not seen the corrected oh, agenda, okay. and that's, that's great. Super. <clears throat> okay. Uh, no questions for staff at this time. All right. Um, then at this point, we'll move forward uh, with the... Um, I guess it would be the appellant speaking first, and I don't have any particular order on this, so we'll go with uh, uh, Mr. Cohen. That would be fine. I, I, that's fine. Sure. Are you Mr. Cobb? All right. That makes sense. Yeah, that's right. I understand. My name is Brad Cobb. I live at 1847 Kirkby Road, and I'm the next door neighbor to 1833. I filed this appeal and for myself and on the behalf of the other nine neighbors that live up Kirkby Road. Uh, what we call this area is Upper, Upper Kirkby because it's very narrow. It's between eight and excuse me, between 12 and 20 feet wide. <clears throat> if you park a car on it, you will not get a fire truck, EMT, and/or trash truck pass it. There's no way. <clears throat> there's any, excuse me, there's no way there's any off-street parking. Excuse me, there's no way there's any on-street parking. 
So uh, our concern with this project is the, the house has one car garage. When it's finished, actually, I turned in a letter earlier this week. I don't know if you saw it, but there's pictures where I was able to draw in the pictures and show the parking. There's, there's size enough for one medium-sized car in the garage when it's finished. And in front of the garage is city property where one small car can fit. Otherwise, it will stick into the entrance of 1829's garage, uh, excuse me, driveway. So having said that, I guess our uh, piece to this is that does, do those two spots support 2,100 square feet for that house? We feel like it doesn't, and that will become our problem once this place is sold after it's, after it's built. And, and we unfortunately have seen that people park where they like, have no regard for people's parking. <coughs> they park on the street, um, and I'm not saying the builders, I'm just saying anybody. We've had this condition ever since uh, I've moved there, and I think uh, since the last owner, because there were still only two spots at that time. So things I want to bring up. There's no, since there's no parking on the street at that area, there is permit parking lower, but in the lower part of Kirkby where it's wider. That is placard only. Uh, we know that there's a 160-unit condo being finished at the end of the street. When that's finished, um, I, we feel that those spaces won't be available. I do know that the two-bedroom uh, condos in that uh, condo will have one parking spot. Actually, a friend of mine looked at them. Uh, so as far as you know, parking and relative proximity to the house, there is really none. A uh, couple things that I wanted to ask, actually, is um, now we're more clear about what the city recognizes as off-street parking as far as it having to be a garage. We don't all have garages in this non-conforming neighborhood, but we do have space for the cars to be off the street so they are not prohibiting any kind of through traffic, which we feel is the most important part. Uh, somebody named Dee Nichols from the fire department and the um, – had checked the box that said they had major concerns about the, process, the uh, project's necessary approvals and designs. You know, despite the high uh, fire hazard area, narrow street, restricted access, no turnaround for emergency vehicles, dead end street in excess of 150 feet shall provide a compliant turnaround. That's something we don't understand. Who will provide this and where will it come from? And if it's important to the fire department, why wouldn't this be a prerequisite for the um, parking reduction permit? Um, <clears throat> for us, it's really about neighborhood safety. I understand that the guest house doesn't add to the need for parking. I understand that there are only two spots. You know, the fact that one's on city and illegal, nobody begrudges that. We want them to have the space because we don't want them to park in our area or in the uh, driveway or on the street to prohibit uh, <coughs> trash trucks or whatnot. So um, I think to make sure. Oh, the other point is that uh, the city a few times and the builders have mentioned that we could have this problem if we uh, left the property as it is. It could be sold to somebody that had four cars and we would have a problem and they would have to park down the street and or they would just park haphazardly. Well. That doesn't, for me, really support the fact that it needs a parking reduction. That supports more of what I thought earlier in the letter I sent, is that maybe there could be a covenant attached to the property that states to the deed that it states exactly what the parking is, how restricted it is, and for us, I know it's a sideline, but to be clear, not to rent the separate um, unit, the uh, guest house. Even though it's illegal, we know a lot of people do it, and we know that it's not investigated that far once somebody says they're related to the owner. So um, these are our concerns. And if you have any questions, I'd love to answer them. And appreciate you looking at this. Any initial questions for the appellant? You will have rebuttal uh, later as well. Okay. Mr. Torgerson? When something? I drove by that property today, I noticed that there was no postings anywhere, that there was a hearing today. Do you know, did I just miss it? No, it's not posted. I think there was a posting for the first hearing inside the garage. Uh, but but no, no posting for your appeal. No, I, I didn't know. I should, should I have done that? I didn't know. No, so no only if you wanted, but it looks like you got plenty of <laughs> Oh, no. I mean, you know, I speak for the nine other nine houses up there. 
Okay, well, the pictures know. will be very useful because since there wasn't a sign and we couldn't find the address, I'm not really oh. sure which house. Well, there's not a lot of frontage for the address. That's probably one. Well, okay, so you've clearly uh, okay. been there since yeah. you saw the spray paint. So okay. <laughs> yeah, and, and actually what you have are other pictures okay. for the park. And for, you know, um, I guess where we had a, a problem with saying that there wasn't any off-street parking on the other some of the other houses, uh, we didn't understand how you called the parking, so that's why I just want to make sure you know that we do have parking that's off street. It is non-conforming, but it doesn't prohibit any traffic. No other questions at this time, it appears, sir. Okay. Again, you will have rebuttal time. All right. Um, I'm assuming that the rest of the speakers don't care what order this goes in, that it's not heavily orchestrated, so I'm going to try to have Mr. Cohen speak again. Mr. Chair, yes. Sorry, uh, just a reminder that our procedures require the appellant, and then after the appellant, the applicant speaks. And then the appellant, applicant, and then the interest. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you very much, Mr. Garcia. Can I'll I need go to sit ask here you. Or should I go you, sit down? You'll now you get to go sit down again. <laughs> <laughs> very and well. thank you once again for it was a good keeping yes. us on the straight and narrow. So now we'll actually have the applicant for the project step forward. That's uh, ASIC. Uh, well, we have two cards, I think, from them. We have a consultant, and we have uh, the architect slash owner slash appellant, which is ASIC um, Menach Canadian, <laughs> uh, and uh, also uh, Janelle Williams. I'm guessing you're Janelle as opposed to ASIC. Yes, sir. All right. Good evening, Mr. Kane, members of the, the Planning Commission. Um, my name is Janelle Williams, Williams Land Use Services, uh, 2418 Honolulu Avenue in Montrose. I should just submit some photos that show the prior condition of the house uh, when the applicant acquired the property, showing the, just showing the blighted condition, and it also shows, you can see the elevation change. And it's one copy, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, I just acquired those today. So um, you're not going to get it back now. That's you okay. Okay. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, the subject property is 6,300 square feet, located on Kirkby Road, where the street does narrow to 20 feet wide, and then access to the property is taken off of an alley. And I use that term loosely. That's what the city calls it on their base maps. It's an alley. This alley access is shared by three properties. The subject lot is on two grade levels. The lower level is the garage, and you can see on the aerial photograph where the property line goes, well, it's not exactly on the garage as it should be, but uh, the lower level is the garage, and then there's a stairway that leads up to the upper level of the pad where the house and the guest house are located. The elevation change from the parking area to the house area is approximately 12 feet. The lot is constrained as to options regarding the size of that garage. Uh, as the map shows, the lot line actually hugs the walls of the garage, leaving no option for enlarging. <coughs> the property was originally developed in 1915. The building standards today or of that day were quite different from what property owners expect today. The current owners of the property, when they acquired it, were faced with badly damaged timbers, lots of termite damage, water damage, foundation problems, and other really extreme conditions that necessitated a complete overhaul and upgrade of the property. There was some latitude at the upper level uh, as far as adding some square footage to moderately modernize the property, but the existing garage cannot be enlarged. There's no room on the lot for a code compliant garage. We have identified one improvement that we can make uh, since the last hearing. There is an elevation change or a step up which is inside of the garage that currently hinders the ability to park more than uh, one car inside on the same plane. We do have a photograph that shows that, would you bring that? We're proposing to raise the level, uh, the floor level of the garage so that the entire floor is on the same plane, which will allow 
enough space to park two compact cars. It would be tight, but you could park two compact cars in there. Oh, okay. And then once again, this is going to be kept as terms of evidence. Yes. All right. We're just going to post this, gentlemen. If that's all right. Yes. That's right there. Oh, thank you very much. Here. Okay, the, the next part, I hate to even go here, but here we are. The, the neighbor who's appealing this approval, the decision of the zoning administrator has either converted his own one-car garage into living space, or he uses it for storage or some other non-parking use. In addition, he's installed his own, and you can see it on the pictures, no parking sign, to, it's his own no parking sign to prohibit the use of the public right of way to, to all but his own cars. He has two cars which he parks in the public right of way. One car is completely on public property while his other car hangs out onto the public right of way from an inadequately short driveway to his unused one car garage. We verified staff's analysis of similar conditions within the neighborhood and we concur with those findings that support the continued use of the existing garage and meeting the findings of fact as set forth in Chapter 3050040D1 through 4 of the Zoning Code and staff noted that the development will not need any other exemption from the code requirements such as lot coverage, floor area ratio, setbacks, height, open space and landscaping. Many properties in this area are admittedly constrained with regards to parking. The appellant's parking data provided to you is inaccurate. It is a neighborhood of non-conforming streets, non-conforming parking arrangements, non-conforming lot sizes, such as the appellant's own lot size of 1,900 square feet. Our city is reasonable in the expectation that property owners should be, should have the option of upgrading the services to their properties, modernizing and remodeling their residences to suit today's expectations. Otherwise, we would have a continuation of a blighted and dangerous situation on the subject property, which the owners are trying very hard to remedy and to upgrade. And you have the photos of the blight that was there. Adequate parking for two small cars can be provided with the leveling of the current garage floor, which we are proposing. It's the closest we can come to compliance with parking, and we think it's a reasonable solution given the lot constraints. We're complying with each and every other code provision of the city otherwise. The only relief we seek is for the noncompliance with current parking garage dimensions though with the proposed improvement to the interior of the garage floor will in improve it and would be adequate for two small cars. Uh, a 1,675 square foot house is reasonable for the area and for the lot size of 6,300 square feet. With the, the addition of the guest house, the maximum allowable lot coverage is 40%. We are at 38.7%. Floor area maximum allowed is 40%. We are at 34%. Landscaping provided is 49%, where 40% minimum is required. And as you see, we're not pushing these envelopes to maximize the development, but just trying to make reasonable accommodations and to upgrade a blighted and unsightly property. The code requirements for parking cannot be met given the lot line, the minimum clearances and turning radii required by code, but the intent and the regulation to provide adequate off-street parking will be preserved with the existing garage with the improvement that we propose to make room for two small cars. The modest improvement to the home will not require the loss of any of the parking area. And while it's admittedly a constrained lot configuration, any of the space that is currently used to park cars on the lot will remain as is and we can and will 
improve the condition of the existing garage to the extent that we can. The code envisions upgrades to single family homes in order to keep them consistent with current residential standards to ensure continuity and stability of home ownership. And this modest addition will enable the homeowners to enjoy an upgrading li upgraded living environment at, that still does not generate the need for additional off street parking. As far as the, um, the fire department's comments indicated that the permit should be denied or the house should be sprinklered. The house will be fully sprinklered as required by the code and uh, the de department's, uh, fire department's comment is meant to emphasize the dangers posed by unsprinklered houses on their own roads. We are meeting that requirement. They are, we are also meeting the requirement uh, of filing a covenant to ensure that the guest house is not uh, made into livable space or rented out. That will be one of the um, conditions of approval, and which will have to be recorded with the county recorder. That concludes my presentation. Do you have any questions? Questions from the commission for this speaker? Yes, can you uh, explain this covenant a little more de in a little more well, detail? Well, every time... Does the covenant say that it will not be upgraded by adding a kitchen, or does the covenant say it won't be rented out? It is the staff that prepares the, the language that's used in the covenants. It's the okay, well, conditions the of approval. <clears throat> well, the... Uh, There's a specific language that you wish to add to the covenant, and I'm sure that staff could prepare that. And the applicant is going to speak, correct? Yes. Okay. Questions for the speaker at this time? Not this time. All right. Thank, thank you. you. <clears throat> Mr. Um, Manachekia Kanian. And I only average about 60% correct pronunciation. So. <laughs> Is this a different person? Uh, yeah. So you're. Say, please state your name for the record. Uh, my name is Asik Manachekanian. I'm the architect and co owner. And, um, and and this new card you're turning is someone yeah, else. Yeah, he's my son. Right. And he'll speak as part of your group. Yes. Understood. Thank you, sir. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and um, uh, Commission members. My name is Asik Manachikanian at 3467 Ocean View Boulevard, Suite H, Glendale. So I'm the architect and um, co-owner. And um, I guess my... Um, I would like to ask you if you have any question. I could, because you know, it's a kind of, you know, entirely um, uh, vast uh, area of, you know, discussion. So if you have any question, I could kind of, you know, just answer your question. But overall, just kind of, you know, give you a little bit of history. So as uh, Mrs. Uh, General mentioned, uh, that we bought the property and um, uh, acquired uh, required um, uh, permits. As we bought the property, it was uh, full of junk. We couldn't get even into the guest unit after kind of, you know, cleaning up the property and uh, taking out maybe three or four containers of trash. We realized that, you know, the guest unit is not possible to keep. So we demolished the guest unit, and there's a new uh, guest unit built. The framing is done. We're waiting for kind of, you know, have a kind of an you know, answer from uh, from uh, from the city to continue on that one and also for the main house. What is what's the square footage of the guest house? Uh, 400, 499 square feet. And uh, one one thing I just want to mention that is the house existing house is 980 square feet. Myself used to live in an apartment with about the same size, four people with my family. So we had four cars. So what I'm trying to say with adding to the square foot of the house doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, you're adding the number of cars. You're just kind of, you know, adding more space, which is kind of, you know, 
um, which is required probably by today's life, it's just more convenient. <clears throat> I have a question. Um, I'm sure. Are you ready to take questions, sir? Yeah, please. Please proceed. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, first one is that uh, I know you're a co-owner of that house. Uh, do you plan to live there? Uh, I used to, not now, because, you know, in different circumstances, I had to do, I, know, I had to purchase another property, so, so for my reference, the answer would be no. So then you're developing the property f to, yes. for resale? Correct. Okay. Uh, second question is that when I was up there, uh, I noticed that uh, there was a plumbing uh, that went into the, uh, the bathroom area, and then there was another pl plumbing stub that came out to the, uh, I don't know if you call it bedroom or living space. What is that for? Plumbing. The only plumbing we have is kind of, you know, the main sewer line coming down from the uh, from the uh, wall of the garage. Yeah. On the That's wall, on the guest house, I saw plumbing on one side. Right. Uh, I'm assuming that was for sink. Your, uh, you know, there, was, there was a tub there. Yeah. And the towards the, towards yeah, yeah. the door. We have, the, yeah. yeah. In a guest unit, yes, sure. When you're facing it on the left-hand side, you had another right. side of a plumbing, sure. which had a stubbing going into <clears throat> the room. Right. What is that for? So we're allowed to have a uh, bar sink in the guest house. So that is for bar yes, sink? Yes, correct. And also the pipe is coming from uh, the bathroom. So that's collecting water from bathroom and the bar sink from the living room. And I noticed that uh, you had shell of the house and the roof, you know, that you had it supported. Correct. Um, are you planning to use those, that same? Uh, yes. Yes, we'll use, we'll use the rafters and add another rafter to the existing one to, per, you know, requirements of the city, if we touch the roof more than 50%, then we have to provide a new setback. Since, you know, there's not much room for the house, so we're trying to kind of, you know, keep the existing structure the way it is and modify the structure and use the existing structure as much as we can. Do you have any engineering documentation for the uh, retaining wall that's existing right now? Yes, sir. As you're going up the door, uh, yes, sir. up the steps? Yes, sir. These are the permits we got, and you know, all those retaining walls, there are per permit. They are I, permit. I noticed that there was stone uh, no, we uh, retaining do not, walls. No, we do not. We're trying to reinforce those, those walls with kind of you know, adding kind of you know, caissons behind the walls and bringing up and having a kind of you know, great beam to tying all these things up. Behind those walls, there are some kind of bunch of, you know, um, rebars and also concrete. Makes it more safer. So what we did actually, actually from the day first, start to kind of, you know, reinforce the existing structure, which was kind of, you know, falling apart everywhere. Are, are you saying behind that field stone there are, there's another retaining wall? No. Some of them, some of them, yes. The one that we touched, we provided, as you notice, when you go up, there is a kind of, you know, void area on, behind the retaining wall, behind the stone wall, and it's kind of, you know, empty. So we're providing kind of, you know, um, grade beam with rebars to support that retaining wall, that wall. And the existing walls of the garage, are you planning to reuse that? Uh, probably we have to do something for the garage. This is very kind of, you know, code-wise. Uh, it's uh, if we touch the garage, so it's kind of, you know, non-conforming. So probably we have to reinforce the garage in order to make, sh make sure that, you know, that structure is safe. I just want to touch the last question, mm -hmm. and sure. that is, um, and normally when we hear the cases like this, you know, we look at the economic hardship of that person that, um, you know, who is trying to upgrade the house sure. for the purpose, <clears throat> excuse me, of, uh, let's say, if their family number increased and things like that. Um, you're telling me that you're only doing it for the purpose of uh, reselling the house. Right. Um, and if you're renovating the existing house um, and you've already uh, renovated or demolished and then rebuilt the uh, guest house, um, which could be used for the relatives or the family members uh, with the main house. Sure. And, and you are now adding a significant, about 70% of the floor area to the main house. Right. Uh, and I guess, you know, uh, personally, I fail to, to connect where the, the, where the economic hardship is for the family that was going to occupy that space right. uh, when you're not going to even live there. So I just wanted to make that comment. Sure. Other comments for 
the or not comments but questions for the speaker I do the sheets I have some questions um, the current this, I'm going to go along the same line I was noticing this one picture showing that there is some sort of reinforcement work going on uh, and I noticed that when I drove up there on the existing rock wall sure right Mr. Lee asked the question about engineer is there actually are these engineered and engineering structural drawings relative to this wall that's going up yeah I had I had the structural engineer come over to the job site and you know per uh, his recommendations we're just kind of you know adding some rebars or grade beams behind the walls to strengthen the existing the existing stone walls how tall is this Approximately, how tall is this? Um, wall? Depends. Some of them about maybe eight feet high. Some of them maybe three or four feet high. If, if I look at from from the ground level, that's probably about 12, 13 feet. And I guess on the wall, you're talking above the, the yet, walkway. Yet there is one. There's one wall. When you walk just kind of into the entry, you have a kind of you know block wall. So that's about maybe eight or nine feet high. Okay. And next to it starts that you know stone wall. Since you know you're starting to Going up, the height is going to be less, about maybe nine feet at the most, I believe. Okay, and so the the, the structural engineer gave you recommendations, but he really so didn't provide you structural drawings for that wall. Because those are existing walls, so we're trying to kind of you know reinforce the existing walls with kind of you know adding some kind of you know grade beam on the top, and we've kind of you know excavated to some of the top. Exactly. Right. But I think, you know, for those safety purposes, I think you should get some sort of a uh, certified letter or some sort of a right. uh, order of confidence from your structural engineer right. to say that is, uh, you know, a sound wall. Because sure. as I was walking up that stairs when I was at the site, I noticed that that stone wall was built on top of the stone wall. Right. And, uh, Plus, as you, start you know, to, uh, as you start to add the reinforcement. They were, they were damaged. They were damaged stone walls. We replaced those with kind of, you know, proper stones and had kind of, you know, good size kind of, you know, concrete in behind to tie all together. I'll, I'll be very nervous if there's a major earthquake to stand next to right. that wall. Right. And I guess my, my point on this is if you're going to do the work, to reinforce it, and you, you put some some time into this, just the wood framing that's going there. Right. It's one so thing. To, it's one thing to not not uh, affect it, but if you're going to place that and impact the existing wall, I don't know what I don't know what impact that will yeah, have. Yeah, that wood wall. framing is just kind of you know, to hold the form, which will kind of you know eventually put a concrete on top. Right. Right. Okay. Then we'll remove that. I see. And the garage. Uh, I had a couple issues about the garage. I think. For the question for you, I have is um, that garage obviously is not going to stay like it is, right? Uh, size wise, yes. Right. But you know, structure wise, no. Because none of the plans show the garage being re replaced or rebuilt, but I, obviously you're going to have to. Uh, not replaced, but you know, we have to basically what we have to do is just kind of, you know, keep Bosom uh, again. This is a kind of, you know, code issue. So keep the existing floor joists or roof rafters for the garage and add another one next to it. If you notice... There is no roof on that garage. There yeah, is not. But we <laughs> kept we kept the floor oh, well. joists. So this is... If you, you notice... You salvaged the floor joists and you have them stored somewhere, or what are you saying? Yeah. We, already, we all kept all the floor joists. We have all the floor joists. But if you notice, the floor joist sitting on a plate, a wooden plate, that is rotten. And some, in some areas, it's gone. So we have to replace that and put a floor joist next to the existing one to make sure that, you know, that's kind of, you know, safe, structurally safe. Okay. Um, I think my other questions relative to this issue, I don't, I don't have any, uh, I don't think I have any more for you right now. Thank sure. you. I have a, Mr. Ferguson, do you have a thing? All right, I have a couple things. Sure. Um, the there was a requirement that you sprinkle the home. Was that extended to the guest house as yes. well? Yes. So you have to sprinkle both. Yeah. But you haven't begun that prep at all. I'm sorry. You, you haven't installed that piping no, yet. No, not in the yet. Not home. yet. Okay. Um, but we'll change. We'll change. Uh, we gave the information of the water main. So you've done a flow a flow test yeah, and everything. Yeah. Make sure that you know the flow is enough. But you know we'll kind of you know do that. If we have to change the water meter, we'll do that in order to provide the fire And right now the property has a single 
uh, it's a single address, so it has one water yes, meter, one address, electric meter. Correct. Okay. Um, are you air conditioning the guest house? Yes. Where is the condensing unit for the air conditioner? I just come here. Package unit in the roof. I'm sorry. That's out on it's the a side. package unit in the yeah. in the attic. In the area. attic. Yeah. Correct. Right. That's all that. Very good. And when you uh, for the addition that you're putting on, uh, I presume a soils report was done. Yeah. And right. did that just focus on where you're putting the addition, or did it also take a look at the hillside? No, it generally it's it required in a hillside, even though the area we're working is kind of, you know, flat, but, you know, it's required because it's R1R zone. Okay. How did, many did they uh, do drilling core, core samples in just the flat area where you're building, or did they do it across the property? Uh, actually, in the area that, you know, in the location of the guest unit and also one in the back of the house, which is supposed to kind of, you know, extend in two locations. Okay. I have one more question up to you. Um, okay. Um, so I just have you know, mentioned that you know, the land is kind of, you know, it's decomposed granite. Mm -hmm. It's pretty hard. Sometimes we couldn't kind of, you know, just do it with a normal tool. We had to use kind of, you know, jackhammer. Mm -hmm. um, how many homes were in the, oh, I'm sorry, how many homes? How many bedrooms were in the existing home prior to the remodeling? Uh, my understanding was, my understanding is that, you know, in the existing home, I saw a kind of, you know, drop ceiling. I thought maybe there were two, two rooms, but, you know, talking to the neighbors, they said, you know, it was one bedroom, one big bedroom. One large bedroom. In the large existing. bedroom. And it how many bedrooms are in your redesign, not counting the guest house? Three bedrooms. So you're going from a one, one large, large to a three bedroom. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. <coughs> All right. Now, I took, and, and just to build on this and may come back into deliberations, I took the liberty of stopping by the building department and looking at your plans. Right. And I noticed that... Uh, along with the, the plumbing stub that Mr. Lee had pointed out, which you've answered, um, you also have an entire line of cabinets going down the whole length of that wall. Now, I have to just telegraph that when I see those cabinets and I see that bar sink, I see a place that's going to have a refrigerator and it's going to be occupied. And I know that's a big what if, but that's what I see. Right. Now, the, the, the big question I have for you sure. is, is knowing that you wanted to increase the square footage on the home, and knowing as soon as you did that and you were talking to planning that you'd need a parking exception, why have you done all this work before you got the parking exception? We thought maybe just kind of, you know, we move ahead of time, we just kind of, you know, do, because, you know, there was already a guest unit. So we kept, so the original permit was to keep the existing, to remodel the existing guest unit. May I approach? Yes, please. This is the original permit. In the original permit, we tried to keep the existing guest unit. See, this is right Sorry, at the property Mr. Chair. line. Yes. The way that does can be put up on the. the um, yeah, I'm just trying to figure out about the public's that. ability let's, to view let's that. Let's have you come around. I have to take this back because this is the original permit. I, I, no, I understand. We're not sure. going to keep no. those. Oh, sure, sure, sure. I want you to come around <laughs> so that the camera can pick it up. And we'll let Mr. Collin hold one side, and then we can all. Go ahead. So, in the original permit, we got three, three, three permits. One, to remodel the garage. Two, to change the roof, re-roof the existing house. And three, to remodel the guest unit. When we just kind of, you know, uh, cleared the property, we, when we went in and noticed that, you know, this is not possible to keep. No foundation, no, everything was rotten. So we had to cancel this and get a new permit for a new guest unit. So this is a permit for new guest unit. So that was the process. Just, yeah, so, so that was that. previous. There was a, a previous permit Correct. just for the guest house. For the guest house. So this is the permit only for the guest house and this retaining wall. So in the original permit, this would work as a retaining wall. A stud wall working as a retaining wall. So all the studs were rotten. And we could not get into the building because it was full of junk. Uh, when were the uh, permits issued for the garage and the guest house and the house, respectively? Do you have the dates? Dates, yeah, they're here. May 22, oh. 2008. Of 08? 23. Oh, sorry. Of 08. 08. Correct. For all three of the permits? All three. Okay. And also, we renewed that for August 1, 2008, for the guest unit and these retaining walls. Okay. All right. So we were trying kind of, to move ahead of time, try to kind of you know, do as much as we can. 
to save some time. But recognizing there's certainly a certain amount of risk when you do something sure. like that. Yeah. All right. Sure. Um, unless somebody has a question on that, the plan, I'll let you go back right. to the speakers. That leads to my the question that I was going to ask because when I was up there and I saw the uh, structure hoisted up, the new I think we're good with that. Uh, new foundation that was poured was actually the you know the original uh, house, right? Um, and so you know by looking at your permit that that explains why, and you know it just based on that permit process, you do not, you are not triggering any of the uh, this parking, you know, reduction? No. 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 But the reason you are here is because you want to add now to the, uh, the main east, house. You know, the main house. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And so, so that was the question that I was going to ask is that the, you have already poured the footing and all that. And, right. And it's, it's construction. So when I was there and I see this, uh, you know, addition, you know, on the plan, but, you know, I, I didn't see any construction on that part. So like I guess, you know, you, you're right. But uh, you know, so looking at your, uh, the, you know, primitive plan, you know, explains, you know, what it is. So, right. uh, so you, your original intent was to really renovate the house, exactly. make it beautiful, and you know, make it modern. Uh, and you know, and, and at the time, what was your thought process as far as um, what was at the time that when you asked for the permit? Right. And what is it now is different that you're asking for more footage? Uh, we're, hoping, we're hoping to get a kind of you know, permission to add to the main house. But what, what's, what, what, what's your reasoning? What, you know, during your process of uh, applying for that permit, right. you're fine with the way it was to remodel the house. Right. Now you are coming before this board and, and, and before ZA to increase the size of the house. And so what, what happened in, in So originally the we originally we asked to increase the house. So that that map shows that, you know, what we were suggesting to add to the main house and also then after that got the permit for the, uh, for the guest unit. Now originally, 10 months ago, we, we filed for a kind of, you know, parking reduction and asked for addition for the main house. So we did that from the day first. So we're just kind of, you know, doing the same thing. I mean, we're asking the same thing. Question for staff. Yeah. Did that complete your line of yes, question? Yes. Question for staff on that um, guest house. Is that considered an accessory type building, like a garage, in terms of setbacks? The guest house would be required to meet the same setbacks as if it were brand new. In this case, it would be required a 10-foot setback for the interior property lines. Does it have that? The new guest house does. The new guest house does meet this, so there's no variance issues based on the demolition and reconstruction. Correct. So we're good on that, all right? Yes. Thank you, staff. Other questions for the speaker at this time? All right, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you very much. One point of clarification, we thought it was one bedroom, one bath. The county assessor um, assesses it as two bedrooms. Okay, thank you. That is. Uh, and then we have... Uh, the card for ASIC, if you wanted to still speak. ASIC? Yeah, that was me. Oh, oh you have your names. Okay. Same person. I'm sorry. There's Michelle. Wait, he, he, was, he was Michelle. Oh, that's Oh, right. <laughs> okay. So uh, okay. All right. Would you like to speak? You have a card. All right. Good evening, members of the City Planning Commission. My name is Michelle Manachikanyan, and I'm a Glendale resident, and Asik is my father. And um, I want to talk uh, a about a couple of things. One is specifically in dealing with the property and having gone there after my father and uh, his partner purchased the property and having walked through it and seeing what it looked like. And it was in, in a mess. It really, really looked bad. And so... I kind of feel like it was uninhabitable, and some of the things that I noticed is there was no lock on the door to the main house, so you could open the door and just walk in. We walked to the very end of the house into what seemed to be a closet area, and I'm telling you, the house was curving down. So I think, uh, you know, definitely the foundation was bad, 
and it was definitely uninhabitable. A, a second thing, and this is all in support of developing this place and making it look better and be better for the future resident, whoever purchases the property. Um, I think that the neighborhood will be safer as a result of this development because when I was there, I noticed plenty of beer cans, beer bottles. I think that people probably came there late at night, I don't know when, and just opened the door, went in, maybe inhabited the place for short periods of time, and then left when they wanted to. I don't know who they were, but uh, I also saw the guest unit, and literally there was no place to walk in. I remember seeing what looked like paint cans, um, lots of old records that had been damaged by water damage, and that to me is a fire hazard. And the whole place was a fire hazard with all the weeds and brush that was growing everywhere. It was literally hard to get through the steps to go up to the main house because you have to take the steps to go up there. Um, I believe that with the improvements that my father and his partner are making, that the property value will actually go up. And so I think that's an asset to this neighborhood and the wonderful people who live there uh, will actually get a benefit from the development. And I think my father has made a really good faith ep effort along with his partner to meet with the uh, neighborhood, including a neighborhood meeting that I attended where the neighbors were there and they got a walk through and they got to see the property as it was and they got to inspect it. So, uh, and, and on a couple of other occasions, he actually had planned to meet with the neighbors, but they couldn't make it. So he's gone out of his way to make sure that the neighbors, this is not, uh, it's not us versus them. I think this is where my father is really humbly trying to make this work for everyone, including whoever end is, ends up purchasing this property. Um, I also want to address the number of inhabitants issue as far as the square footage goes. Uh, right now, my father, my mother, and my younger brother live in a 1,700 square foot condo in Burbank, and there's three of them, and they have three cars. As my father alluded to earlier, we had a two-bedroom apartment in Glendale previously when I was younger and my brother was younger, but we still had four cars. So there was four of us in a 900 square foot apartment and we had more cars. Hence the argument of more cars, you know, square footage increased. I, I think that if you, you know, if you have a really rich person, single person buys that property and wants to turn the guest unit into a game room or um, a lounge, well, they'll only have one car. If it's a, you know, uh, let's say a five member family that purchases the house, maybe they'll have five cars. But that's out of the, the you know, the out of the hands of the person building the property. Um, and I think that in these economic times that are very hard, I think that it's good that they're developing something and that they're, they're bringing business to the neighborhood. They are, you know, getting people hired and, and letting them do their job. And I think that um, one of the uh, main reasons why they should be allowed to build a bigger house on this property, that there is such a parking problem, is specifically because you're trying to appeal to the buyer. Whoever has bought properties in this neighborhood knows that there is a parking problem. I was there. It's a hazard as it is. I mean, I don't even know how the approval for any of these homes was ever made with the narrow street that leads up to them. But I think that comes with the territory. And whoever ends up purchasing this place will know that, okay, we have, we're going to have parking issues. There's going to be limited parking, and we're going to have a problem. But at least the appeal might be, hey, we have a really nice guest unit. We have a really nice main house. So what the heck? It's okay. That makes up for it, perhaps. And I think that is one, one other point to keep in mind. Um, thank you very much for your time. Just make them all have motorcycles. Right. Make them all have there's motorcycles a, a or, or take for bicycles it. or something. Yeah. There's yeah. a covenant. But I think I think it comes with the property, and and I think whoever is going to buy it is going to have to understand that. Okay, this is one of the drawbacks. Just as any of us would be looking at the positives and the negatives of moving into a new neighborhood, I think that people are smart enough to go, hey, this might not be the place for us. Whereas somebody else might say, hey, this is perfect for us. It might have a drawback, but it also has this positive. So thank you very much. All right. Um, is uh, Ms. Arant part of that, uh, part of your group, if you will? All right. It would be appropriate for you to speak now, too, please. My name is Lauren. <coughs> Excuse me. Lauren Arant. Um, I'm a resident of Glendale. Of it's okay you got four. close. Everybody is about that close. Um, I'm a little bit nervous, so um, I don't have any 
<laughs> okay, well, that's good. Um, I don't have any prepared remarks, but I also toured the property. I'm here in support of um, Osik and his partner um, and the development of this property. And uh, the particular point that I wanted to speak on is I'm employed by a homeless services agency in Pasadena. Um, we're the biggest provider of homeless services in that area. Um, and in touring the property uh, when they first purchased it, um, what uh, the other speakers have alluded to of the state of the property, the property is also uh, consistent with homeless encampments that we have seen in Pasadena in abandoned buildings. Um, the neighbors might not agree that that was going on in their neighborhood, but there was obvious evidence of camping, probably partying as well. I don't know if those were consistently the same people, um, but that's in the main house. The main house was a hazard, so whoever was camping in there obviously um, didn't have anywhere else to go, um, was probably in need of services. Uh, the property is 180 degrees from that now. Um, I actually contacted another homeless service agency in Glendale and asked them if they could do a little outreach in the area and check and see um, in that particular neighborhood where you might not think there was a problem if they could check around and, and you know, we have an outreach group that does street walks and that kind of thing. Um, and look for anybody who might be in need of services. Um, and I don't know how many other abandoned buildings would be in the area, but that one clearly had taken on the, um, I don't want to say aura, but that's what it had become. Um, and in, in this case, it's now um, the entryway uh, is blocked off when they're not doing work. Um, they're, you know, They've installed other security measures as much as they can with the building still being, the property still being open. <clears throat> so it's not a hazard to anybody who might enter the property illegally. Um, and I just can speak to, from what we've seen, the way other properties are taken care of that, have, that are in that state in Pasadena versus the way that these gentlemen have handled their property. Um, it's really admirable. Um, they've done a really good job, and they've done a good job with the neighborhood outreach, which is something that we work with in our uh, organization. That's, that's all I have to say. I'm just supportive of um, <coughs> sort of the adding to the value of the neighborhood as opposed to what was before, not just a fire hazard, but a big safety hazard. Thank you. Any thank questions? You. No, thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. I've got, um, well, it looks like it'll be two more. Okay. This is the last call for cards. Okay. Um, just to alert what's going on ahead. We've got interested parties. We've got a representative from, I'm guessing, fire department? Fire department that we'll hear from. Then there'll be a rebuttal time for the applicant, and followed by, finally, rebuttal time for the appellant. Um, now we've got the Nick Nazarian, who's the owner of the property. Okay, you've got one minute, because you had 15 minutes as a group. Get on up. Have your say, sir. I sure. That'd be good. Hi, uh, member of commissions and ladies and gentlemen. gentlemen. My name is Nick Nazarian. I'm a co-owner with ASIC, and I'm living in 8545 Latuna Canyon in Sun Valley. And uh, the reason why we are here, I thought it's, it's a accommodation for the parking space. And um, there's three things. Uh, I'm going to make it short. Um, as Michelle brought it to your attention, um, adding to a square footage, it doesn't mean especially that we are adding parking spaces. Because I'm a single person, I'm living on an area that I have 16 acres land, uh, four bedrooms, about 1,900 square feet. I have six cars for myself. And I have my cousin that is living in Glendale in two-bedroom apartment, and they have three cars. So square footage and where we're living, it's relatively uh, inconsistent of anybody's uh, argument that we are adding cars or whatever. So that's one point. Second point, the applicant himself is uh, violating what is um, saying that we're off street parking because he's parking his car on, in the street on a public property. And we have measurements, we have pictures that they have two cars, they never park it on a proper place. They have to park only one car in their garage, but they're parking two cars off the street. And one car is on their property, but behind the car, about three feet of their car, it's on the, on the public property, on the public, public right away. So the, the person who is appealing for parking space, he is already violating 
the parking rules, and I don't know how come he can stop us from Let, months let's of May. Let's focus on your situation, okay. sir, okay? Okay, our situation, uh, and uh, all we are asking, it's not even a parking reduction, is to accept the parking that it is. Parking reduction, it means that we, reduc we, are, we are reducing a parking place <laughs> from existing, but this is an existing situation, and the parking is, the garage is an existing garage. We're not asking more or less parking space as it is. It is an existing situation. And uh, the other point that Gunal brought it to your attention, the assessor's map says, assessor's says that it's a two-bedroom property. It's not a one-bedroom. That is very important to not, although everybody thinks that it's a one-bedroom. Thank you very much, sir. Right. Questions? Thank you. Questions for this? Yeah. Uh, there is a question for you, uh, sir. Well, it's, yes, a, sir. it's not a question. It's a, it's a, it's a comment because you, you, sure. did, you did mention that it's not a parking reduction. Yes, it's not a parking reduction. You're, uh, but you are asking for to add to your property. Yes. That's why it triggers that uh, parking requirement. That's correct. So if you stay the way it is with the existing uh, you know, footprint, then you have no problems. You can use the existing garage. I understand. Okay. Uh, the, the, what I was uh, bringing over, the, the, the word reduction, it means that uh, if we are doing some project that we, we want a parking reduction for that pro project, uh, that's an interpretation of the word. If, if I, was, I was just meaning uh, uh, the interpretations are, are different, maybe. Uh, we're not asking a reduction. There is no any parking reduction that we are asking. We are asking to use the same parking space as we can for our addition. So that was a word interpretation. All right, thank you, sir. Sure. All right. Um, interested parties, um, it's, it's lovely penmanship, and I'm going to guess the name is Cheryl uh, Gilliam? Gilliam. Gilliam? Gilliam? Gilliam. 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 I'll read him. Yeah. <laughs> <that's good>. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, Commissioners. Good e evening, Mrs. Fuentes. Um, actually, I'm very pleased to hear that many of you have been on the premises because the canyon is unique. It's very different, so I'm very pleased that at least you are out there and can visualize what it is we're talking about. Anyway, my husband and I are owners of 1841 Kirkby, and this property has been owned and occupied by my family since 1962, so we're aware of the environment and the neighborhood. The gentleman that lived in this house um, for many, many years uh, was stricken with rheumatoid arthritis. He tried to live in the house. He tried to stay there. He had two daughters that lived in the house with him. It became, over the years, more and more physically impossible for him to live there. and. Um, as we all know, rheumatoid arthritis is debilitating. He finally left the property. Um, there have not been, the property is surrounded by other houses. There have not been transients in the property. Um, I don't care to go into that, but I am almost 100% pos positive that that is not the case. The house has just been vacant for a while. At the permit hearing on January 2nd, I suggested that construction be stopped until 1833 Kirkby Road could be visited by city officials to determine the appropriateness of the construction, which you all have done. That being said, this is the problem. It is my opinion that this project should have initially been heard in, in uh, front of the design review board before any construction was even started particularly with what they're calling a guest house that is nothing more than a shed that was just has not been occupied in all these years. All construction has been stopped on the site by the city for a reason I'm not aware. I don't know why this has happened. If you re review the last two pictures of Brad Cobb's letter dated to the city on January 2nd, you can see in the pictures that the new, new under construction guest house and the proposed deck on top of the garage are intruding spatially into the only outside deck space that Brad Cobb has on his property. That's his only exterior open space. But the obvious issue is the lack of parking for 1833. 
And again, look at the pictures. Regardless of how many additional bedrooms are allowed on this site, with the new guest house and the approved addition to the home, there are only two parking spaces available, one in the garage and one directly in front of the garage. There is no way a car can exit the garage if there is a car parked in the empty space in front of the garage or the contiguous parking space, which common sense dictates, should be shared with Brad Cobb. This is the only parking available to the owners of this property. As ASIC could testify, he usually has to park on Verdugo Road when he comes to visit the property. And as you know, when those condos are built, that property will probably not, those spaces may not be available either. I respectfully request that the parking reduction permit be denied. I also request, if it is in your power to do so, to submit this project to Design and Review Board for their review before construction is allowed to continue. Thank you. That concludes my... Thank you. Any thank questions you. for the speaker? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cohen, we've tried several times to bring you to the podium, and it's <laughs> finally your turn. Third time's the charm. I'm obliged to be charming. You did that like you've done it before. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, I'm Jim Cohen. I live at 18... Uh, uh, I've got 1833 brain, in my brain here, 1851 Kirkby. We've lived there about 10 years. Um, other than the fact that I agree that the house was in deplorable condition, uninhabitable, uh, there probably isn't anything else that I agree with. So what I thought I would do is supply you with an alternative set of information and let you be the trier of facts, uh, and we'll kind of go from there. If you would like a picture of the stone wall, uh, in no particular order, the stone wall that's without support built on top of the other stone wall, I have that that you may keep. Um, the issue with the parking is that 1833 is uniquely challenged within a four-block area. We're just up from the college, as those of you who have been there know. And within four blocks, there is permit parking on the street, and there is private parking on residential land. And that's it. Uh, 1833 is unique. It has the, the actual street abuts the garage door. Uh, it, the uh, city property is on a lot line with a garage door. So any car parking in front of that is parking on a city street, public property, and illegal. Um, and the next open parking for that would be by permit either on Lower Kirkby or somewhere on Verdugo or within three blocks by permit, which the owners have. Uh, there's 126 uh, new families moving in uh, on the corner of Verdugo and, and Kirkby, so that, that will be uh, substantially more cars. I know some of the City staff used to live in that building when it was an apartment building and said that uh, you want to get home early because no parking after about 5.30. Um, I, I think the city has acknowledged that Kirkby, Upper Kirkby, our, uh, our neighborhood term, is a fire lane. Uh, it currently, I've supplied some pictures that disappeared somewhere, um, uh, that uh, show that the city has been up there. Uh, there was quite a group that met there and determined that they would post it for the term of the construction and after the construction uh, discuss what signage for making Kirkby into a fire lane. Uh, there's a little bump out in Kirkby. It is not an alley. Uh, my understanding an alley is a secondary road usually behind a residence or a service road. There's a little bump out, and again, there's some paperwork that I supplied, but it's somewhere on your on your desk there. Uh, the issue that is that one car in the garage at 1833, the second car will either be on public road or be blocking someone else's uh, uh, driveway. And I hear the buzzer, but I'd like a couple more minutes if I can. There's a, there's a number of facts in the report that are not consistent with reality. The zoning administrator's report says that no one on the street has more than two uh, 
off-street parking, which I understand means garages. Mr. Hill, across the street, has three. Plus, he has seven or eight off-street parking spots. Everyone on Kirkby has their own off-street parking. And that's where their friends and their family park. I know that the one gentleman I saw viewing the property on your committee had to park down on Lower Kirkby and hike in this morning. The issue of who's going to reside at 1833. I've supplied you with some paperwork that show that the title report on 1833 lists it currently with new information by the current owners as a duplex. The guest house has been wired so that there is a separate service in the one bedroom for a kitchen where the cabinets that you were mentioning. It's also been wired so that you can separate meter that property. We don't believe in the neighborhood that they intended to live there since one of the builder's wives signed off on title the same day that they originally bought the title and recorded. And you have that paperwork also. So we're concerned in the neighborhood as to where the people who live in this, by the way, it was a one bedroom, one bath residence. So it is now about to have five bedrooms and three plus bathrooms. We don't know. I'm not sure that that doesn't encourage more cars and more people living there. And I've got a few other things, but I think some of the other folks probably will cover that. But if you have any questions, we've lived there 10 years. My office is in Huntington Beach, so I work out of the house when possible. So I'm there probably more than some of the other neighbors. All right. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. Questions for the speaker? And then thank you very much, sir. The next card I have is Max Bramey. Bramey. That's exactly how I said it. Exactly like you said. I'm Max Bramey, and I currently reside at 1841 Kirkby. I'm Rich and Cheryl's son-in-law and actually put in the first offer on 1833 when it came on the market when Larry passed away. The house was in great disrepair. I live directly below it. If there's so much as a noise up there, I'm up there with a flashlight and was until it was purchased by these gentlemen back here. There's never been anybody living back there. I'm very protective of my area where I live. It states in here that, you know, the city does offer permit parking on Lower Kirkby. I have two hanging units for guests that would come to my house. It's probably been three months since I've been able to utilize them because there's never an available space on Lower Kirkby. Besides the condominium unit that is in the process of reopening, there's a multi-unit apartment building on the southeast side of the street, and there's a series of duplexes and triplexes on the northeast side of the street. All those people have permit parking, and they constantly – it's a battle about where you're going to park. None of this really started until they started renovating the property, and we saw with the workers and everybody how everybody disregarded the neighborhood and just parked in people's driveways, blocked their garage doors. That started this whole thing. The reality is it's the smallest piece of property on that road, and there's no parking. So the question is, it's just where are they going to park? That's my question is whoever lives there, where are they going to park? It's a very close-knit, single-family neighborhood. It's not a neighborhood of rentals. Everybody's been there long term, and we're concerned about – one of the reasons we backed out of the deal with the house, what they're calling a guest house was a dilapidated shed that had no roof, had no walls, had no windows, that had not been lived in for 50 years. I think 50 years ago a gentleman did live in it, but we backed out of the deal because of the sheer amount of work that would be necessary to make it livable, and with it being such a small lot, it wasn't worth it. It didn't balance. There was no reason to put that much money into such a small living area. So I did want to say that the permit parking, although it is available in Glendale, is nonexistent in that area. Thank you. Questions for the speaker? All right. Thank you, sir. All right. We have a representative from the fire department who I think we would like to have address this, please. 
evening, Mr. Chair and members of the Commission. I don't think I've ever spoken to you before. My name is Doug Nichols. I'm the Fire Prevention Coordinator. All these years, this is the first time I'm pleased to be here. Um, I'm prepared to answer any questions, but I thought I might just uh, address a few items that I've heard come up, and I know uh, uh, Mr. Collin has briefed me a little bit as uh, perhaps what some of the issues might be. As far as the Kirkby Road being designated as a fire access road, the fire code terminology, and I'm referring to the 2007 California Fire Code, which we adopt locally as our 2008 Glendale Building and Safety Code, uh, requires that structures be within 150 feet of a fire apparatus access road. And that distance is to the uh, rearmost wall of a structure. It's not to the closest wall. And basically that uh, has been required to allow the fire department to extend a hose within 100 feet of the structure on all sides of the structure. If that is not within 150 feet, uh, the fire marshal is able to make allowances if there are certain findings to be made. And one of those exceptions is if the structure is sprinklered, that distance can be extended. The code does not specify how far that can be extended. It's uh, strictly up to the fire marshal at that point as to how far that can be made. The other issue that faces uh, the residents of Kirkby Road, and we see this throughout Glendale, as you know, we've uh, got a very older, old community with older streets, older homes, uh, existing non-conforming situation uh, throughout in many of our canyon areas and in older parts of the community, where if a street itself is a dead end, greater than 150 feet, it needs a turnaround uh, that can accommodate fire apparatus, which also is helpful for uh, trash trucks and, and whatnot. And as you're aware, Kirkby does not meet that requirement. And in reviewing this project uh, during the entitlement phase, before we'd actually seen uh, architectural plans, at least in detail, uh, we traditionally just make the comments uh, where codes are, are uh, apl applicable. And so we just note that that is a code requirement. Uh, obviously, you can't be changing infrastructure in an existing neighborhood, and we recognize that. However, we do just want to make sure that, uh, that the uh, applicants, uh, planning staff, uh, yourselves in this case, are aware of what the code requirements are and just take that into consideration. We, we recognize that we're not going to be getting a legal turnaround there uh, at all, regardless of how long we plan ahead. However, new homes, new uh, subdivisions, new streets, we'll certainly expect to see that. And uh, it, regarding the requirement for sprinklers, uh, when we have a structure that is remodeled and the valuation as determined by the building safety department is, is in excess of 50%, it automatically tr triggers sprinklers based on our local code. It's not a, a state code, it's our local code. Uh, again, not knowing in the entitlement phase as to whether or not that would be triggered, uh, we look at the implications of the project itself and, and seeing the uh, knowing Kirby Road as, as we do, and I've been up there many times, and it is being in our, our high fire hazard area, narrow street, uh, limited access, and when we have densely populated areas with the structures close by, uh, perhaps uh, close to the property lines. We feel that because of that uh, exposure structure to structure, sprinklers are appropriate. Uh, and especially because of the limited access for us to actually uh, approach the area with fire apparatus, that gives us that extra step. You know, obviously there's a medical emergency. We have much better access with our rescue ambulances to get into a, such a tight area. But with uh, fire or some type of conflagration, it's not so easy. So having those sprinklers installed in structures gives us the step to that we need those, so those extra minutes, if you were, uh, if there were a fire uh, within a structure, sprinklers uh, keep that at bay until we can get there. So it does work quite well in those situations. Not a perfect solution, uh, but it certainly helps in this situation. And we use this uh, uh, throughout when we do have some of our older neighborhoods, again, similar situation, uh, dense, densely uh, built areas, or it just happen to be close together with the, with the uh, you know, previous way, way things were built in times past. So those are some of the issues that came up uh, that I heard, and I'd be happy to answer any other questions uh, that you might have, or if there's something else that comes up, I'd be happy to address you. Mr. Okay. I have a question. Uh, this may not have a track, you know, uh, 
relationship with the, uh, the current project right now, but what is approximately of the, uh, the fire hydrant uh, in the neighborhood? You, you said, you, you know, your requirement is 150 foot. Obviously, it's more than 150 feet that are required to put in the fire sprinkler system. Are you or talking about the fire hydrants? Existing, yeah. Well, what are the connections that uh, you're referring to for, the, for your fire trucks to come in and then fight the fire? Where's your closest hydrant? Yeah, I guess, yeah. Oh, I, I don't know where the actual closest hydrant is, but I know we have a spacing requirement of 300 feet from hydrant to hydrant. Okay. But I don't, I don't uh, have the diagram as to where the exact location Share that is. with us during rebuttal. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah. And how many of the houses do you know in the neighborhood are sprinkler? I would doubt any of them are because our ordinance did not come into effect until 1988. Or very few of them. Yeah, unless it was voluntary, and I, I, I doubt it because people wouldn't voluntarily do that unless they were in a major renovation. In that case, it probably would have been required. So I, I would suspect that this would be the only one. Uh, on your visits to the neighborhood, have you, um, on your occasional visits, I suspect you probably wandered in the last week or so knowing this was coming up, um, have you seen situations where the parking has been so intense that it would have blocked a fire truck? Uh, actually, we have had a rescue vehicle for that. Yeah, we, we have had uh, a number of situations where similar projects like this have come up, and we actually get apparatus uh, to do that. And we actually did have uh, one of our apparatus try and go up there uh, and couldn't get through at the time. They, was that like during construction hours, or is that this was, was that probably about park? four or five months ago? So it was like residents parking that was yeah, blocking just it. Probably a standard, uh, you know residential activity at the time. Knowing that it's already a nightmare parking in that area, but also knowing that your rescue vehicles are being blocked, um, has the fire department thought about making no parking one side? Oh, we always would like to request that, but uh, have we also... Have you requested it? Not on Kirkby Road, no. Okay, because no. I can just imagine the yeah. firestorm that would create. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a balancing act. Uh, uh, we did have a major project along that line in the Adams Hill area several years ago where we actually worked with the community to identify certain areas because there were some locations we could not even go through the road and turn without our bumpers swiping across into shrubbery. Uh, so we actually had to identify, but again, up there, some of the situation, narrow streets, limited parking, uh, you know, garages right on the edge of the street, and if we just go painting red curbs everywhere, then no one can park. So it is, it's, uh, we work carefully with the neighbors, with the traffic uh, team, uh, with the fire uh, team as well, and try and work a cooperative because they, we, we all know that it's in everyone's best interest, but there's also the need to provide adequate parking. All right. Thank Whatever you. you have, give it over to Mr. Cobb. He can present it during rebuttal, okay? Oh, I, I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. If you'd like, Mr. Cobb can present it. All right. Anything else that you wanted to say, sir? No, be uh, just, just for questions of anything else. If not, or Other something comes up later, I'll, I'll be available. Okay. Any so other I did have a question. So yes. are you telling me that on the narrow portion of Kirkby Road up to the end, there's about 12 houses in there, a rescue ambulance with cars parked as people are in the habit of parking along that row, a rescue ambulance wouldn't be able to get up to the end of that street? Uh, we were, I was talking about a fire engine that, uh, that we had difficulty. Rescue, unit. rescue ambulance probably would not have too much difficulty. You know, it's, it's not much wider. It's just a, a large van. Uh, so typically they can get in, you know, where the apparatus couldn't, which is helpful because we, uh, you know, obviously have a gurney there that we like to get as close as possible to a house. So I seriously doubt that they would have that difficulty. Would they be able to turn around and or would they have to back down Kirkby Road? It, it may take a little negotiating depending on who's having a party that evening, but uh, I would imagine they could probably get in and out. They're pretty creative. They deal with this stuff day in and day out. Thank you for okay. now. We appreciate your comments. Okay, we're going to enter into rebuttal time on the part of the applicant. So your team has a brief period of time for rebuttal purpose. Whoever, however. Uh, again, my name is Asik Manajikanyan, um, 3467 Ocean View Boulevard. I just want to kind of, you know, just uh, refer to some of the comments of uh, neighbors. Uh, electric service is only one electric service for both buildings. And so the current, the current service that you, the, the box you put in is a sub-panel. Sub-panel, yeah. It cannot be two electric panels, just one panel for in the entire property. Uh, blocking the driveway only, only partially happened, happened when we had a uh, kind of, you know, concrete mixer. 
for concrete, uh, to pour the concrete for the foundations. That was the only time, and I was there all the time, make sure that, you know, everybody's kind of, you know, okay. And that kind of, you know, last for maybe an hour or so, uh, and they were kind of you know, coming in turn and putting concrete going back. Uh, no parking signs put in place a few months ago, and in the beginning, I admit that, you know, I parked uh, the front of Mr. Cohen's property, but, you know, after a couple of times, then, you know, I noticed that, you know, he's not, he's not happy. Then, you know, me, we moved the car, and I uh, kind of, you know, got the permit from, uh, from the city, and I used to park either on uh, Lower Kirkby or on Verdugo all the time. So ne no one ever <coughs> blocked the street when we started the construction. Um, that's all, I guess. Any question, if you have, I would be more than happy to answer. Questions? Okay. Um, in terms of sprinkling, the garage will be sprinkled as well? Um, probably we will sprinkle the garage too because, you know, it's going to be two heads. However, we have to kind of you know, take the sprinkler to Getting it. So heads. all the property will be sprinkled. Well, because the fire department said all structures. Yeah, right. Is that a condition of your permit right now that the garage be sprinkled? No, it's not, but, you no, know, we're willing to kind of, you know, put the sprinkler system in the garage. All right. Is there anything else you want to say during your rebuttal time? And I'm talking about your entire group. I guess um, nothing special. Well, it appears Ms. Williams might uh, want to something? jump in. Thank you very much. I you bet. I, just, I drew a quick sketch of the approximate location of the fire hydrant in relation to the property. Which is, what are we suggesting? Of the property, the oh, so the within 100 feet. Mm -hmm. you, you've, you've labeled it as 60, 60 feet. Right. But so any way you look at it, it's plus or minus okay, that. Okay. And then I wanted to uh, reiterate one address, one meter. And we cannot change the configuration of the lot line around the garage, but we can make the improvements that we uh, identified that we could make. And... Um, for the record, it is not the smallest property in the neighborhood. Uh, our property is 6,300 square feet. The appellant's property is 1,900 square feet. And uh, for just to help illuminate what we're talking about in, in terms of our deficit for the interior um, dimension, what's required is a clear 16 feet by 18 feet interior dimension on the garage. What we have is 15 by 17, so we're a foot short in either direction. That's where we need relief. Um, <clears throat> if you have any other questions, we're here to answer them. Mr. Torgerson. Any... For the record, will you describe what this uh, addition to the uh, you had a, a method or a means whereby you could add a I, little bit of square footage to the garage, and I want to make sure we all understand what that proposal can, is. If I can approach along with ASIC, we can show you on the photographs right over here. That would be fine. The site plan. Site plan shows the oh. On the garage. <laughs> This is the floor of the garage. Right. Here's the floor of the garage. There's this is a curb. curb. There's yeah. a curb, and that curb. It's 18 inch by 6 inch. If we fill this area, we're going six to fill inches. this area here to make it all one. Is that actually a curb, or is that the edge of the footing? Probably part of footing, so we don't want to touch that. So if we fill this area 6 inches, so we'll have 15 feet 6 inches interior of the garage. So basically, we're adding 18 inches to the width of the garage with doing that. So we wouldn't be broaching or breaching the existing footing. We would just be raising the floor level up to the footing. So the final dimension of the improved garage would be what? 15 and a half by 17 and a half. Interior 15 and a half by 17, 17 and a half. half. Which is six so inches see. short. We need a direct oh, right. The height would be minimum seven feet required by the code. We would still be able to meet the height. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Williams, did you have any other comments? No, sir. 
All right. And no further questions at this moment for the applicant. All right, Mr. Cobb, it's uh, time for rebuttal. My name's Brad Cobb. I live at 1847 Kirkby Road. Um, just to clear up what has been said, uh, the house we bought has a 1926 garage. So the opening is like six feet and ten inches. My sob cannot fit in that garage. So because of that, I park on the my property, which is in front, and the back portion of my car does hang off into an area that is considered city. I'm not throwing any stones about them parking on city property at all. Uh, you know, to me, that's that needs to happen for them to have this house, regardless if they get the parking reduction permit and add the space or if they leave it as is because they need those spots. You, nobody can live in that house as it is now with one spot. I would never want to stop that. So uh, <clears throat> these uh, two city spots that are in this little nook that uh, end up right at the end of my property, um, for folklore says, and so does the man who grew up next to the house that I've been able to to talk to when it was being built have always been shared by these two homes. And um, I think at the beginning when they came and they weren't certain about that, we had to instruct them and say, hey, this is our space. Even though the property line says it ends here and this is city, we're going to share this and we're trying to be fair about it. I don't want any more than what little bit of city I have to park. I can't fit in my garage. I'm guilty of putting a bicycle down there and riding it for exercise. I don't live in it. You know, nobody would. And um, the uh, parking space in front, I mean, I guess the city would have to make sure it's okay that, you know, since that would be an Ill Ill illegal spot, it should be okay to park there, right? Is my point. I mean, otherwise, there's really only one spot. And then we would have to fight and fend for the one spot that's next to my car in those pictures. So because the agreement is so... Uh, the agreement has been easy to keep because the parking is so dire. Nobody wants to take somebody else's spot because that could change easily from day to day. And anybody just wants to get home, park, and walk in their house. They don't want to have to run up the hill, ask somebody to come down, move their car, be told five minutes, and wait. So <clears throat> that's the kind of problems we're <coughs> concerned with. And, you know, I, I hope that they are able to build the property, sell it to somebody who has a lot of money, doesn't drive a lot of cars, and everything's fine. It just seems like such a specific mar market to build a property for <coughs> is the only thing. Um, and I know that, you know, I respect these guys as builders, very savvy businessmen, very smart about all the conditions they're meeting to make this property happen. And I know they need to make a profit. And I, I hate pushing against that, but I do feel like the problem will be handed off to us when it's sold to whoever has the money to buy it. I doubt as nice as they are, I doubt they will wait for the ultimate buyer with the least amount of cars. You know, the property was completely blighted. It was terrible. Uh, I'm not aware of any, you know, homeless people that live there. That's just not a reality to us. Um, and I'll, I also just want to state that they have been doing a great job. They're really good builders. They've been fixing it up. It looks way better. But I don't think anybody should get brownie points for doing what they need to do to sell the property. I mean. If you don't fix it up, you're not going to sell it. And the, and, and the property was priced appropriately for as blighted as it was. So to walk in and decide that you didn't know what was happening on the property seems bizarre to me. So I, I think it's appropriate that they – it was a teardown. Everybody knew it was a teardown. Everybody in the neighborhood looked at it before it was sold. Um, and I think it's great for sprinklers. I just, there's a, a weird irony because I'm a worst-case scenario guy in my head that – their house will not burn as the parking is clogging up the rest of the houses from access of fire trucks, you know. So um, it, it just doesn't seem – I mean, I know there's no legislation here for you guys to say, hey, you know, we're going to let this build and there's never going to be more than two cars. If that were the case, I would have no problem. But that's not the case. So um, I think that um, – I, I would I would hope that um, heck, I, I would hope that it's uh, built appropriately to the parking that's there, and you know the garage is recessed back a bit behind my property, and already their trucks have knocked off my stucco and run over the <clears throat> uh, sorry um, uh, garden, which isn't a big deal, but it's more about. Once, you know, if it's widened where two cars can park in there, how are they actually going to pull in? That's my point. 
So it's really just logistics, and, you know, I, I really hate pushing against these guys for making money, but it just doesn't seem fair to the rest of the people. I mean, it, 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 excuse me. If, if it were a situation like the other people on the street where, <clears throat> say, the hills, and they remodeled, they were remodeling to live there. They dug out the hill, they put in caissons, and made the appropriate size garage because they could. I understand this property would be way too hard to do. The mows up the street, dug out their hill, put in an appropriate garage, but they're living there. So it's, it's you know, that's fine. It uh, makes sense. The only thing that's a little weird is that we're building this and we're going to sell it in good luck. You know, that's really the emotional component of this for us because it still is our neighborhood and we want to keep it nice, you know. All right. Are you ready to entertain any questions from the oh, commission? Absolutely. All right. Questions from the commissioners? Nothing. I guess I see nothing at this time. Uh, closing comments from staff? I believe we're set with you. Thank you, sir. Basically, as mentioned, the application is for a parking reduction permit triggered by proposal of floor area to the house. And as mentioned before, the guest house floor area does not figure into the triggering of uh, requirement for number of spaces for parking. That's solely based on the house square footage. Um, there are difficulties with the property in terms of topography as well as the shape of the lot. And um, I guess as an aside, the applicant was mentioning something to the effect of modifying the existing garage but if the existing garage exceeds 50% with both the roof and walls being removed, then that's going to trigger a whole different situation because then they'd have to meet current code requirements, which would then trigger your setbacks, your parking um, dimensions, would then have to meet code. The height um, is a distance. The garage door would have to be off the property line, which is 18 feet. So it would trigger several variances if they do exceed 50% of that existing value for the garage which is a whole different ballgame than what we're talking about here. As in leaving the garage as in and maintaining the existing walls and roofing, or at least maintaining it such that 50% remains. 50% of the existing garage. Of the existing, that's correct. Right. And that's the structural components. And not 50% of the garage plus the house. Correct. It's a separate entity, mm -hmm. separate calculation. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I, mm -hmm. that was I had one question. Aggregate. Uh, previously, the, uh, I know we've had uh, an item that we t spoke about previously about the termite inspection, and I guess my question would be, was there a, a complete termite inspection done on the, the house as far as? Uh, Not to staff's knowledge. No. And, and I, don't, I, I didn't go up enough to find out the extent of the, the existing structure, how far along it is. But uh, I guess my concern is, and, and the reasoning we had around the termite inspection was that if there was additional changes to the house found, uh, caused by finding additional uh, termite damage, Do you, if, if we could, just to get an answer to that. Well, let me, let me just ask uh, to staff, to your knowledge, was there anything involving the 50 percent rule involved with this project? It really it's doesn't not, come so into that, play. That's true. That's really it's a great question, but I don't think it came into play. Thank you. Well, I guess to, for the addition of the house. For right. the house. For the house. Or, or, or for the garage. Yeah. Well, the gr well, well, in fact, that would be another pictures, point. I, right. I guess it's totally worth 50 percent. So was there an inspection? Right. Termite well, inspection of the house okay. at all? No, I mean, in terms of termite, staff is not aware of it. It's not something that's normally required. It might be the garage. It might be an issue in the garage. Yeah, that's true. So. Because uh, when I was up there, I mean, I looked at the structure. That seemed like it was uh, all dry rot damage. I have to say that um, we could go down this path, but I think um, everyone, the applicant as well as the neighborhood, is better served to let the garage remain and let it be repaired regardless of 50 percent. Let's not focus on that. I, I think that would be opening up a, mm -hmm. a tougher can of worms for the neighborhood. I don't, I don't disagree with that, but I have, I have other issues about your statement as far okay. as the garage. So, okay, we're well ready to go there. Or however, well, all right, we'll get into we'll get into deliberation in just a moment. Okay. Anything else, Mr. Collins? That's it. Thank you. Any other questions, Mr. Collins? Mr. Torkerson? 
In the uh, letter from the city of uh, Glendale by Edith Fuentes to Mr. Cohen, it stated the application did meet the finding of facts set forth in Chapter 30.50.040-D, 1 through 4 of the Zoning Code, and I would like to see a copy of that. Is that the parking reduction chapter 30.50? In other words, I'm sorry. findings of fact in order to grant an exception like this is what I'm interested in seeing. Thank you, Ms. Fuentes. Okay, we, we all need to read this, I believe, before deliberating. Mm -hmm. So uh, could we have uh, maybe take a recess, Mr. Chairman, and uh, get copies of this distributed to the rest of the commission? Um. Well, let's, yeah, let's wrap up things so we can take a brief recess. Let me at least um, close the public hearing in just a moment. Yeah, okay. Then we'll take a recess and we'll get some copies of this minute. And I think you're right. It's appropriate. Okay. Any other comments or questions to staff, to any of the speakers? Okay. We're going to close the public hearing. We're going to enter deliberations. We're going to take a very brief recess prior to that. Uh, literally while we wait for some photocopies and have a chance to read the section that was referred to in the zoning administrator's hearing. And uh, we'll reconvene in just a couple of minutes. So for now, we're in recess. Okay, we're uh, back from recess. Uh, the public hearing has been completed, and we're going to continue with uh, our be commence our deliberations. Uh, who would like to go first? Uh, no. All right. Very good. Thank you. At this morning, I uh, I drove up to the property um, and actually uh, was not able to uh, find you know sufficient area for. To, to park my car, so I did drive down to Lower Kirkby and uh, discovered that it was a, a, permit, you know, a parking by permit only, so I had to park illegally there and post up my uh, commissioner parking pass. Hopefully they don't give me a ticket <laughs> for parking there. And I walked up to the uh, to the property, uh, and uh, yeah, I mean it is uh, it is a condition where uh, I think. If the car was to come down the road, I mean, you cannot, you know, maneuver your way up, you know, through the, uh, to get to the property there. Uh, it is very narrow road. Um, here where I, I have some problems uh, with is that some of the languages that was uh, uh, used to grant this, um, uh, you know, parking reduction uh, by zoning administration, I'll, I'll get to that. But uh, the intent of the... Um, uh, or that when you request, uh, you know, parking reduction uh, and improve the property. Um, as it was, it was a, a one-bedroom, maybe two-bedroom house with the uh, guest house, uh, you know, being used by growing family or relatives uh, living there. Uh, it, it was served as a three-bedroom house or maybe four-bedroom house. Now, with the uh, new addition, uh, you know, it'll serve, you know, it'll be almost like five bedroom house. So, uh, I mean, I do have concerns, uh, you know, uh, that whoever might purchase a property, and uh, clearly the applicant has indicated that he is building that uh, property and making improvements to the property to, to resell the property. Um, and yes, uh, you know, uh, the property needs a uh, major uh, facelift, and uh, I'm glad that uh, uh, the developers are uh, developing the property uh, to make it livable. Uh, and I think the neighbor should be uh, appreciative and happy that, that he's doing that. But um, 
some of the language that's uh, written I'm going to refer to uh, that I do have some problems with, and that is the second page of Exhibit B or uh, B. Uh, it says, uh, it is intent and purpose of the parking regulation to provide for the general welfare and convenience of persons utilizing the various uses within the city through the provisions of a suitable off-street parking. Uh, and also, uh, you know, when I was reading through this, uh, conditions um, were under applicability of a 30.50.020 uh, in you know, Section D3. Uh, you know, it says sufficient parking will be provided to serve the use intended and potential future uses of the subject parcel. And the letter says that this has been met. Uh, I, you know, I find it very difficult to, to accept that. And in summary of a zoning administrator's decision, uh, the second paragraph says parking reduction permit request to allow the addition without changing or enlarging the existing non-conforming garage will accommodate additional needed spaces to address the changing needs of the users. Uh, so that's why I asked specifically, specifically in the beginning whether or not the applicant will be occupying this space because this language was in there. Now. You know, I could, I could see, I could sympathize, sympathize with some of the, um, uh, you know, the variances or the, uh, the conditional use permits that come before this board, you know, uh, requesting the variance, uh, you know, uh, on the basis of reasoning of the economic hardships uh, and uh, the conditions that exist is there um, to, to serve the need of the growing family and so on. Uh, I, I find it difficult uh, to, to grant, uh, you know, this uh, application. So uh, I'm of the opinion, um, uh, you know, I, I don't think the parking uh, issues were uh, really dealt in the right way. Uh, I think there's a, there's a problem with the uh, on-street parking and off-street parking as well. Um, and you know, as is, I mean, even with the existing uh, space, I think you, you have a problem by adding, allowing uh, 690 foot, 695 square foot of uh, addition to the house, I think it will just compound the problem for the neighborhood. So um, I am uh, for the appellant, and uh, I, I do not support uh, ZA's uh, decision here. All right, thank you. Who would like to go next? I'll go next. Thank you. Yeah, my first my first issue I have with uh, the zoning administrator's decision in this package and the uh, applicant, uh, not the appellant, but the applicant's uh, attention, and this is just subjective. Um, frankly, I don't believe 71 percent increase in square footage is a modest addition. <clears throat> that was used both uh, in testimony here and in the write-up that I'm uh, unhappy with. Um, the issue isn't really whether or not it's a good idea to add square footage or renovate this house so we can so we can put it on the market and have a nice livable place instead of some sort of abandoned property. Um, that's not what's before us. What's before us is the issue of whether or not we can allow parking to be uh, substandard or not. Um, the issue is not whether or not any of the neighbors are parking incorrectly. Uh, that's a matter between uh, the police department, the transportation department, the fire department, and not something that's in front of this commission. Um, the findings we have to make include all three of the uh, findings that I won't read, but the third finding is that sufficient parking would be provided to serve the use intended and potential future uses of the subject parcel. And short of doing something with the garage to allow two-car parking um, so the future owners of that property could theoretically have two small cars and a car on the driveway and play musical cars on their own to get people out of the garage. That's their problem. Um, short of that, I couldn't make that finding in this case. 
So I would have to uh, be in this, uh, agree with Mr. Lee on, uh, on that. Um, the applicant stated that they, they talked about some sort of covenants. Well, there's no, there's no covenants, restrictive covenants uh, listed in any of these papers that we got. I thought there were. That's why I asked about how the wording uh, went because I missed them and apparently they're not there. So uh, um, I couldn't, uh, I mean, the covenant to not rent out the house as a condition of approval was brought up. The covenant not to park more than two cars on uh, the property. Um, that idea came up. Um, There's a general problem with the neighborhood, apparently the narrow part of uh, that street with uh, any cars parked at all prohibits fire trucks from coming up there. And that concerns me quite a bit. Um, that would be another reason not to uh, want to allow this uh, Parking exception because there's any chance of having more cars parked up and down that narrow part of Kirkby. Um, now, if they came in and said, "Okay, red curb on both sides of Kirkby," the rest of the neighborhood probably would be upset, but uh, that would eliminate that concern. Um, and the last thing that I uh, would mention is that uh, in the zoning administrator's uh, approval, she basically said that the transportation department didn't have any objections, and then later as one of the conditions, she said the applicant shall comply with all traffic and transportation section requirement as specified in their memo. And maybe this is just a process problem that we have to deal with, but uh, the director, the assistant traffic and transportation administrator, Mr. Mitchell, had written on the front of this IDC, inter Interdepartmental Communication, that the office does not have any major concerns. He checked that box and then said, see comments on page two. And then page two, he lays out all these major concerns about uh, the uh, addition of this many square feet, 71% increase, could uh, increase the number of vehicles to be stored and additional parking, and uh, planning should be aware of these facts. Apparently, planning decided that uh, they were aware of those facts and uh, they weren't concerned with those facts. But um, I see what the traffic, I read the traffic and planning or traffic department's uh, comments as being a, a between, between the traffic department and the fire department, I think there's enough concern about parking on that street to uh, warrant uh, denying this. And that's where I stand. All right, thank you. Mr. Sheets or Mr. Berman? I'll go. All right. Definitely not cut and dried. I commend you for taking on this task. Obviously, it needed the work and the changes, and it's quite a challenge. And I think you put a lot of a lot of effort into it. Um, I will make one comment first. The, it, there were some statements about the size of the property and the changes of the property and whether it warranted uh, a, a reduction in parking and, and whether people would park there or wouldn't park there. I think, I think it's been pretty well proven that, uh, and the reason we have those codes is that there's not adequate parking in our city. And if we don't do something now, it's just going to continue to get worse. And so I think that is the intent, that if every change that occurs in the future, we make a, a good effort to put what is deemed to be the basic required parking, that will help in the future. And I think that's the intent there. As, as far as whether people are going to have five cars or four cars, you know, that's a whole, that's a whole different issue. It just, it's another layer about the same issue. But for me, uh, in driving up to that property, and I had the same problem as far as being able to park. In fact, I kind of idled and drove back and forth and had to back up to turn around. Um, 
in what I read in the package and what I've heard here tonight, uh, m my picture was that the, that the, uh, the owner was going to enhance the property and live there. My perception probably was stated that way, but now I know the usage has changed. I was kind of confused by the what I perceive during this process, the, the fragmented stages we went through. Uh, I really wasn't aware until you shared with us that there was an issue and a permit to, to do the guest house, and then, and then there was a return to, to then do the additions and changes to the, the main house. Uh, and then I remember reading something that said, the, as far as this request, that the garage was going to not change, it was going to stay. This garage is not going to stay. If it's going to stay like this, we've got bigger problems. It's not safe. Uh, the wall is not safe. I understand that, that there are many of these structures in the city, but now we're in a different situation. We are going to make changes and something has to happen here. So um, if I look at this in total now, something has to happen with the garage. You're making a great effort to try to reinforce the wall, which is, which is commendable. Uh, look at some of the pictures that have been provided about about the, the existing conditions and what I saw out there. And, I, and I'm, a bit, I'm troubled by the fact that I don't see anything about a change to the garage. Before I dug into this process, I thought the garage was going to stay as it was. Maybe some upgrading, but this is not upgrading. There's major changes that have to occur here, and I don't know what those look like. I don't know what the intent will be to make changes to that garage just to leave it like it is or to, to, to maintain it at the size it is. And now knowing that it's going to be fixed up for sale, if, if in fact my thinking is right, you, you have to change the garage. As it exists today with the off-street parking or the on-street parking, the garage is not usable because cars park where your radius would be to turn in the garage. <laughs> if I'm going to change the garage, then I'm going to change the walkway. If I'm going to change the walkway, I'm going to have to change the wall. And all of that is structural work. I do underst I understand the way the package was presented, that it's at different levels. And my original reading this was, well, wow, that would be literally impossible to change that. There's different levels. You have conditions that were, were uh, built into it as far as the property lines and such. But now that I look to the extent is what of, of how the property is going to change and what will have to occur with the garage, in my perception, what will have to occur with that garage. And if I change the garage, and, and I don't see that, I don't see the drawings or the details, what will that do to the, the walkway and the wall? And I'm confused by that. I'm, I'm concerned, not confused as much as concerned about that, because it's not enough for me to be confused by I don't know what, what will happen to, happen to that garage. Um, My original thought was if you were going to stay here, you probably would want to upgrade the garage and make it big enough because I don't know where else you would park. And uh, and I guess if the, the one thought I had as I was trying to gather my thoughts, if this garage was in condition where you were just going to use it and were, were making a request to use the garage and not change it drastically to accommodate for the additional f square footage, I, I might have felt different, but I don't see that, and that's not what I am perceiving in this picture. So, I have real concerns about uh, about the request to leave it like it is. Now I see where you're coming from on that. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank so you, Mr. Berman. Yes, I went through these pages and pages of different opinions, and so I have least experience here. So I. Let you all talk ahead of me on purpose because uh, you really put into words what I've been thinking uh, about it. But and I, I'm amazed at how thoroughly you go through each project. And, and uh, I mean, uh, we have everything you've said I agree with, and so uh, that, that's about all I could say at this time. All right. Thank you. Um, well, what a unique neighborhood. Yeah. Um, I never had the challenge or the pleasure of driving up there before. 
and I just had no idea. And when I look at the, the home sizes and the lot sizes, wow, that's unique. I mean, Adam Hill, you know, make, looks like the mansion district now. So, uh, it absolutely astounding. So, um, to me, it's it's pretty simple. Um, well, first off, um, I heard everything that was said about the garage, and it may require a certain bit of machination on the part of the building department and evaluating. Um, evaluating how structurally sound it is, what the value of it is, um, but if there's any way that we can minimize the pain associated with dealing with that garage in terms of having to make it larger and then and then trigger a whole bunch of unforeseen consequences on setbacks and stuff, I, I hope that goes fairly smoothly for, for the neighborhood because I think it would be, that's where I was coming from in terms of pain. However, to me it's pretty simple. It's how do you view the added square foot and does it intensify the demand of parking in the neighborhood? I mean, clearly, um, staff didn't view it as an intensification, but I respectfully disagree and I certainly do view it as that. Anytime you add 695 square feet, anytime that you add this number of bedrooms, um, you're going to add backing up for a second, and you've recreated a guest house that's fallen fallow and hasn't been used in all these years, just rebuilding the guest house is an intensification that they're allowed to do. It's just not a question, okay? But by between that and then adding 675 square feet to the home with those added bedrooms, added bedrooms is going to attract a larger family. I, I, I just can't get over the fact that I view it as an intensification. And as a result of that, I would have to overturn the zoning administrator and approve the appeal. Does anyone else have any other comments? All right. Mike, please. Yeah, I just want to make it clear. I'm, I'm all in favor of the rebuilding, the remodeling. I don't mind the guest house as long as uh, it's not for rent. Doesn't have a kitchen, you know, per code and all that. Um, and if the city, if there was some way of saying, yeah, go ahead and do this project, but um, you must guarantee that there's no off street parking and provide for two on property parking spots, then it would be a different situation. But I don't think there's any mechanization in the code or mechanism for doing that, short of uh, having the city and transportation department take a hard look at the parking in that neighborhood with a big condominium going in down at the bottom of the hill. That's, that means parking off property, on-street parking is going to be uh, basically non-existent. Yeah, you, the one can start to build other conditions yeah. once you make the change. Because I went through that thought process. Maybe they could take down the garage and do outdoor parking. See, now, now we're all going... Then, then you the mandate the size of the car. And so uh, let's, let's say they could redesign the whole project so they could do a 20 by 22 car garage per code. Um, and it triggered having a setback variance and a this variance and that variance. Well, there's a process for variances that say if the four findings can be made right. and it's a unique lot. Well, this is pretty unique. Yeah, you, could, you could probably easily make those very, I don't know why I won't, won't say <laughs> easily. <laughs> Mr. Garcia, did you want to jump in on variances? <laughs> but, um, yeah. it's you know, it's, it's, it's not, uh, all hope is not lost if they had to go through that process and apply for variances. Uh, because if they did something that eliminated the parking problem in the neighborhood, chances are the neighbors would be happy to have a decent house built there and you know, new, new neighbors and uh, no extra on-street parking. To but this fashion. particular application and this particular uh, um, parking reduction permit, I just have a couple support. Yeah, Mr. Lee. Yeah, um, as you mentioned, that I think the neighborhood is really beautiful. I think, you know, uh, I, I know that uh, you, you know, do not have many houses up in that uh, call the psych area, but I think uh, you should consider, uh, I mean, since you know, the whole neighbors I gather here, I should consider applying for uh, historic you know, preservation. Comments. <laughs> All right. Now, uh, based on the um, conversation we've had, we're going to need to create a motion uh, that overturns well, the zoning administrator's um, findings of fact. 
and maybe something already written up. Oh, very good. But we have to come up with some verbiage. And it could, you know, whatever phraseology you want to include. Whether it's intensification, uh, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, no, you no, might I lost the findings of fact. I'm sorry? I think you might want to. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the D1 through D3. D3. Yeah. Right. Oh, you found it? Very good. So you're about to try to make a motion, is, is that what I'm seeing? Now, Mr. Chair, I would uh, like to try to make a motion. Please proceed. Uh, well, I move that upon review and consideration of all materials and exhibits of current record relative to parking reduction permit case number PPR 2008-006, located at 1833 Kirkby Road, Kirkby Road, and after having conducted an appeal hearing on said matter, that the Commission hereby reverses the Zoning Administrator's decision and denies said parking reduction permit case number PPR 2008-06 written by the Department of Redundancy Department. Uh, based on the following findings pursuant to Title 30, Chapter 30.50.040, Glendale Municipal Code, specifically item D3, which requires a finding that sufficient parking would be provided to serve the use intended and potential future uses of the subject parcel. Um, and the motion is that uh, that finding cannot be made. All right, I have a motion. Second. W Mr. Garcia. Perhaps Mr. Uh, Torgerson or, uh, could uh, spell specifically how it doesn't meet that requirement, just so the, the record and the finding is clear when it, uh, for the motion. Okay, the uh, reason that sufficient parking would not be provided under the proposal in front of us is that the current garage, even if it was repaired as a one-car garage, the current code needs a two-car garage, and the additional intensification of use brought upon by 71% increase in floor area ratio uh, makes in the Planning Commission's collective mind it uh, apparent that um, that's not adequate parking. That's good enough. Maybe we just say approximately 71%. Approximately, well, well yeah, sure. Being an engineer, that works for me. And we have a motion. We have support. Would you call the roll, please? Commissioner Schitz. Aye. Commissioner Torgerson. Aye. Commissioner Lee. Aye. Commissioner Berman. Aye. Aye. And a vote of uh, five to zero. Ten, uh, um, PPR 2008-006 at 1833 Kirby Road. The uh, parking exception was denied. Uh, here's where I get into trouble, similar to the Chief Justice, where I paraphrase anyone that's not uh, in, uh, that agree, anyone that disagrees with this decision has 10 business days or calendar days, sir? 15? It's 15 days. F 15 calendar days okay. to uh, appeal uh, to the planning department on this floor. Uh, the appeals go to the, or, yeah, the Municipal Services Building or the City Clerk's Office. And I sure would like to see that in writing the next time we have one of these so I don't have to. <laughs> we were get just talking trouble. about it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, and that's appeal to the City Council. And that would involve an appeal to the City Council with the appropriate fees. Um, so that item on the agenda is complete. We're going to move on to agenda item 10, which is Planning Department updates. Thank you. We do have an we have one update. Um, last Tuesday, the City Council adopted an ordinance to permanently transfer the duties of or last oh was last night oh whoops last night um, it was late night. <laughs> the uh, Council adopted an ordinance to permanently transfer the BZA duties to the Planning Commission for appeals. And also, we did receive a letter from the State Department of Housing and Community Development that they will certify our housing element, and we are taking that to the City Council for adoption on the 27th at their 2.30 meeting. What's uh, the next element we hit? Well, we're working on the North Glendale Community Plan right now. Okay. And we don't have to deal with any of the general plan elements anytime soon? Well, eventually that will be a, a cornerstone of the update of our general plan. We intend to do community plans throughout the city till we have all of them done. Then that will be uh, a new focus of the way we're looking at doing general plans, community-based general plans. All right. 
I don't recall. I had a question, if, you, if I may, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. The original housing element, I believe it was a housing element, specifically had a paragraph saying that guest houses and uh, second units were actively to be discouraged in the city because of the increased parking requirements and the increased burden on the local infrastructure. Right. We do have that finding for second for second units. However, guest houses are not second units. Um, guest houses do not have kitchen facilities, um, and they're only intended to be accessory to the primary use on the property. They're not a, a separate guest house unit. can have a bathroom, can shower, have a bathroom, bedroom, can have a shower, kitchen. cannot have a kitchen have a and kitchen. cooking That's facility. The same as a granny house. No, no they're different. A granny flat can have they some a cooking facility. Well, what's, what's the maximum size that's allowed? I yeah. believe it's, I'd have to look at the code, I believe it's 500 square feet. Oh, is that, that's why they're 499. Yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> and it's uh, as a detached dwelling, what does it do to your floor area ratio calculations as far as? Well, it would still be subject, I mean, your lot is, you have a certain amount of square footage that is allowed on your lot. And so that would include okay, so your that, the floor area ratio secondary, be your second units. Current, yes. Yeah. Okay. I'd Thank be you. I'd be very interested. And we move from updates into comments. Um, I'd be very interested in in brainstorming and seeing if there was a way to put more teeth into the no kitchen. Because it, it's so clear that it's so easily abused. I, I wonder if there's some some process, some method. Um, that it that it could be regulated a little more strongly. Well, this is something that I have personally had to deal with in my career in four different cities, <laughs> and uh, the best process we have is at the counter. We can just be savvy, and as Mr. Collin can say, because he manages the counter, and catch things as they happen. There's no guarantee that we can say that they will not add plumbing or kitchen later on. Well, how, about, how about getting rid of the uh, bar sink, uh, per, you know, permitted bar sink? No, oh, but it's okay to have a bathroom. Yeah, but you have a bathroom, but you at least you bathroom. don't have the stub, and it's one more step in the process. Maybe, maybe it's as simple as getting rid of the ability to have a bar sink. Because once you have a bar sink and you've got all that countertop, all you have is a refrigerator and you got a house. Exactly. We, c we can consider, we, we will look at options with the Building and Safety Division to see if there are any ways that we can limit this. That's I've, an option we can look at. I've done about 30 retirement centers and in a five foot width you can have a refrigerator range and everything. There you go. <laughs> That's right. In yeah. one it's piece. All stuck. Yeah. Yeah, um, in a place in college like that. Yeah. <laughs> the closet. Right. Any <laughs> you can do with a hot plate a small Any uh, yeah, you call that living? Um, anything else from the planning department in terms of comments or updates? All right. Uh, any comments from commissioners besides what we've already chimed in on? Could I uh, get a motion to adjourn? So moved. I consider us adjourned.